Several miles downstream, Lou sees another picnic table in the Mayaca State Forest. The state forest is 8,590 acres within the city of Northport. A grill near the table is full of water, and Lou sees a small turtle swimming inside. She catches it and sits on top of the grill to eat it. She hears grunting and digging under the oaks. A family of wild hogs pushes through to the edge of the water. The mother drinks as the piglets splash around her. They are descendants of pigs that the Spanish brought to Florida 500 years ago. From her perch, Lou sees how the pigs have rooted up the soil and plants. A Florida scrub jay glides by. Lou watches it land on a saw palmetto. The trunk is black where a fire burned. A black beetle crawling there is almost hidden, but the jay catches and eats the bug. Once called the Florida jay, it lives only in this state. The jay needs scrub oaks and scrub pines to live, and fire helps them survive. Many trees have been cleared away for roads, houses, and orange groves. Winchester Boulevard passes through this forest, so a sign there warns Scrub Jay Crossing. At the edge of Mayaka State Forest, the river widens. Lou misses the oaks and palms that grew on its banks upstream. She sees an island covered with mangroves in this wide part of the river. It is a rookery for wood storks. Lou swims to the island. A stork is watching. It flaps its wings and sounds an alarm. Other birds see the otter. The birds know that otters eat birds' eggs and baby birds. Several storks soar above and others perch on the low branches of mangrove. They don't want Lou near their rookery and they swoop toward her. She turns away from their sharp beaks and dives deep into the river. Hi, I'm Carol Mahler, author of Adventures in the Charlotte Harbor Watershed. Today, I'm at the television studios of the school district of Lee County, and with me is Tony Westland. Hi, I'm Tony Westland, Supervisory Refuge Ranger at the J.N. Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge out on Sanibel Island. Thanks for being here today. Yes. Um, and you're going to read part of the book. I am. The section on fire written by you. Sand hills, pine flatwoods, scrub, and marsh need fire to live. Without fire, these areas would change into another kind of habitat. For years, people have stopped natural fires started by lightning. Now, managers of wildlands start fires called prescribed fires or controlled burnings to protect wilderness without hurting people or their property. Thanks for reading that. Yes. Have you ever participated in one of those controlled burns? I have. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, along with lots of agencies, um, help out to do prescribed fire and, or controlled burns so that we don't have wildfires that get out of control and, and harm people. Well, now, how does, it, how does starting a fire help keep having a fire? You know, it's taken a lot for people to understand, but there are lots of animals and plants that benefit from fire. Um, one of the first ones is the gopher tortoise. For example, the small gopher tortoise crawls along, lives under the ground in a burrow, and a lot of these areas can get congested with lots of vegetation, dried vegetation, um, and as soon as we burn that down, they're safe down in their holes. We burn small sections so the wildlife isn't harmed. Um, and as soon as they come out, within a week or so, there's fresh new sprouts of wire grass, which they love. <laughs> um, well, now, what would happen if, a light, if lightning did start a fire? So, of course, fire and lightning, it's all natural in Florida. Fire is natural, and we have lots of lightning strikes. So the problem with that is we don't know when it's going to happen and where. So if we have these prescribed fires and we do it on our own time in the right temperature, wind speed, humidity, we can purposely set these in small sections, put areas of fire breaks so that um, it stops. Like in this picture where it would burn right up to the road and then it would stop. And of course we would have tankers there and working with local fire departments in case that for some reason could jump the road. But we take all the safety precautions and do it during the best time, it's also called a prescription, um, so that we don't have those things. Well, thanks for talking with me today. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Carol Mahler, author of Adventures in the Charlotte Harbor Watershed. Today, I'm at the television studios of the school district of Lee County, and with me is Tony Westland. Hi, everyone. I'm Tony Westland, Supervisory Refuge Ranger out at the JN Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge on Sanibel Island, Florida. And Tony, you're going to read part of the book for us today. I am. Thank you. I'm going to read the section, Endangered Species, Threatened Species, Species of Special Concern, written by you. Endangered species are groups of animals that might not survive because there are so few alive. Some endangered species are sea turtles, wood storks, Florida manatees, and Florida panthers. People have hunted some and pollution has killed others. Many are in danger because people have destroyed their habitats to build homes, roads, businesses, churches, schools, farms, and groves. Threatened species and species of special concern are groups with more members, but their survival is also at risk for the same reasons. Some threatened species are the Southern Bald Eagle, Florida Sandhill Crane, Florida Scrub Jay, Fox Squirrel, gopher tortoise, and Florida black bear. Some species of special concern are the American alligator, the eastern brown pelican, reddish egret, little blue heron, tricolored heron, roseate spoonbill, and limpkin. Thanks for reading that, Tony. Now, can you tell me who takes care of these, or who's concerned about these endangered species? Well, we hope everyone's concerned about these species, um, but the agency that takes care of them is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we have the Endangered Species Act. And what does that do? Well, the laws are um, made to protect the animals. Within each state, there's also protected laws, but we are the federal entity that takes care of um, the animals. Now, today you've brought some, I guess, artifacts of some of those endangered species. Yes, you know, living here in South Florida, we listed a lot of them in the book, and I think that's great. Um, we brought here today, this is a shell of a green sea turtle, and also over here is the skull of the most abundant sea turtle we have, the loggerhead sea turtle. Now, if you find any of these artifacts, which you could if you were on the beach, you are not to possess anything from any sort of protected species. Um, and so we actually have people that bring them into the refuge and kind of give them up to us for education. Well, and I think that's a good thing for them to do. Yeah. Now, you have something else here. Yeah, we actually um, have lots of bird species that are protected. And this one is one that I love to talk about because people Right when they think about Florida, they think of oh, the flamingo. And actually, this is our native bird, the roseate spoonbill, named because of that spoon-shaped bill and then confused because of that uh, pink coloration. And what does he use that bill for? You know, that flat bill gets put in the water. It, they shake their head back and forth, sifting through the water, and it slams shut on any crustaceans, small shrimp, crabs, fish. And what gives them that beautiful pink color? Well, I think that's why everything gets confused with the flamingo, because flamingos get pink with the amount of crustaceans, the shrimp that they eat, and it's actually been proven that roseate spoonbills get pinker with age. So when they're born, they're kind of this pale pink, um, almost white. They get pinker with age. Um, hard to see in this picture, but you will often see a dark crimson, dark pink stripe on their shoulder that tells you they're at least three years old and they're ready to make baby spoonbills. And now, am I understanding you correctly that the flamingo is not a native Florida bird? You know, we see them. We have sm small isolated populations down in the Everglades. We've actually had two or three times in Ding Darling's history where we've had one fly in, and that makes a big spectacle when the bird flies in. Um, they're usually blown off course, and then now there's isolated populations in Florida. Well, thanks for talking with me today. I Thank really you. enjoyed it. Not far from the shore, a boy with a fishing pole stands on the pier. Sitting in a folding chair beside him, his mother holds a pole too. His father baits and casts four poles and leans them against the railing. Underwater, Lou sees shrimp on the hooks. She climbs the riverbank and then crawls onto the pier. She hears the boy say, Hey mom, Joey told me that this pier once burned. 
part of it did, the county was going to tear it down, but people asked them to rebuild it because it's such a good fishing pier. The mom says, It would be better away from the bridge. The traffic's noisy. The boy says, Lou sniffs the air. It was here first, and it wasn't a fishing pier. The railroad built this trestle for trains on their way to Boca Grande. The mom says, Why? So people could swim and find shells? The boy asks. His mother laughs. Sometimes, but they had, but they made money by hauling crossbait in the south end of Boca Grande. It was loaded in, onto big ships. Lou creeps beside a bucket full of bait. Black flies buzz around it. Where'd the phosphate come from? The boy asks. Somewhere up Peace River. The mom says. Why didn't they ship it from some place closer? The boy asks. The river's too shallow. Ships need deep water. The mom says. Lou thrusts her head into the bucket and eats a shrimp. The boy pulls his line from the water. Hey, Dad, I caught a crab. The father grabs the net and runs to the boy. Pull it up before it lets go. The boy yanks the pole up. The blue crab drops, but the father swings the net and catches it. The mother cries. Good teamwork. Lou eats another shrimp and another. The father tells the boy. Bring the bucket over here. I'll get the, I'll get the sh crab out of the net. The crab clacks its claws as it struggles to get free. When the boy turns, he sees Lou. Hey, Dad, there's something. I don't care, the father says. He watches the crab. Just get me the bucket. The boy sees Lou dive into the river with a shrimp in her mouth. He carries the bucket to his father. The father sh shakes the crab loose from the net, and it falls into the bucket. Beneath the pier, Lou eats the shrimp. I can't believe the size of this crab, the father says. It's probably all we'll catch tonight, the boy says. What is that? The mother asks. Because something ate all the bait, the boy says. You're kidding. What was it? The mother asks. The boy says. I don't know. It was brown, had whiskers like a cat, and a long, thick tail, the father says. Sounds like an otter. Other fishermen had complained about otters stealing bait and fish. Lou swims under the pier and the bridge for State Road 776. On the eastern shore, Lou sees mangroves. A fox squirrel sits on a branch and a reddish egret wades near the roots. She turns away from the shore and swims into deep water. She can feel the push of the current then she sees a sawfish swimming toward her. Using her strong tail, she steers into Tippecanoe Bay. The sawfish does not chase her as she swims into the shallow water at the mouth of Sam Knight Creek. On the bay is Tippecanoe Environmental Park, 380 acres owned by Charlotte County. People can enjoy the nature trails that include a boardwalk through the mangroves and marshes. It is evening when Lou swims into a creek under the oaks. She hears buzzing and sees a wasp. It flies to a nest hanging from a limb. Grape vines curl through the branches. Near the ground, the vines are as thick as an otter's tail. Cabbage palms stand together and among the oaks. A strangler fig grows around one tree as if it were hugging it. Lou hears a tapping and sees a red-bellied woodpecker pecking at the trunk. Underneath, a skunk digs in the leaf mold for a palmetto bug. A centipede runs past a raccoon holding a crayfish. Crayfish is Lou's favorite food, so maybe Lou has found a home. For free classroom materials, please visit our website at www.chnep.org.